Hello and welcome to YHTV's nominated show, Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzama, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. So we should, we should uh, tell people uh, some uh, what our future is for a moment. We have something planned as a treat for everyone with uh, each, each of our episodes. Uh, we always asked the person we were interviewing for a health tip. Mm -hmm. well, and you know, I have to say, in going through them all, it was amazing some of the things that people spoke about. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, so often the simplest ones are, were magnificent because it was, you understood it immediately, right? <laughs> because you also got the chance to know about them a little bit throughout the beginning of the conversation and what they did and how they reacted. And then uh, to come up with what they perceive as the health tip for other people. It's, it's really a nice compilation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just did a, uh, a very special episode uh, on health tips that all of the interviews, uh, each person that we interviewed gave us a special health tip, and we compiled them in uh, 2012, and we recommend that everybody uh, listen to that. But uh, now we're starting in 2013, and uh, I want you to have the the uh, opening uh, shot at giving us the first health tip. <laughs> the first health tip. <laughs> 2013. You're in the pole position. I'm in the pole position. That's great. Well, I'll have to think of something you're eating. I have to say, uh, take the cans, take the lump in your breast. And the spotting of your and your vaginal spotting seriously, it ain't gonna go away. Okay, take cancer seriously. Don't sweep it under the carpet because it ain't gonna get any better. I mean, you know, if you have a if you have a breast lump or if you have vaginal spotting or they see a a spot on your lung during a routine X-ray, take it seriously. It ain't gonna go away, most likely. Mm. You know, that's one thing I can tell everybody. We see these things all the time where people just sort of hope and pray that it's going to go away and it ain't, you know, and take care of, take care of it. What are the first signs of lung, lung cancer? Well, unfortunately, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it just, you know, you see it on an x-ray for routine, for other routine things. Like, you know, you, you know, who knows they, you know, they seem to x-ray chest for everybody, for everything any you know, these days. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things you'd normally have, well, you normally get sick. I mean, you lose weight, you get night sweats. Uh, by the time you're coughing up blood, it's pretty advanced. So, you know, usually they're found as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, law or as, as a spot for something else they're looking at, maybe cardiac shad, the size of the heart or something like that. You know, Michael, I think your health tip is actually, uh, really great. Although you focused it on kind of cancer as a process, I think it really uh, expands into knowing about your body, taking care of it, being aware of it. And if there is something wrong, that you should uh, do something about it. Yeah, take it seriously. I, you know, since I see most, most of the disasters I get exposed to are cancers that were neglected. And those are the ones that always come to front when I'm asked a question like this. What can you do? Well, take your body seriously. I mean, it'll give you war it'll give you warning signs, and quite often they're early enough that you can actually do something about it. We're speaking with Deidre Manns, a doctor of physical therapy and a certified Pilates rehabilitation specialist, and someone who is going through uh, dealing with cancer. I wonder, just like we ask all of our guests, Deidre, mm -hmm. for a specific health tip. That's something that you have come up with in your life, be it in your experiences now or in physical therapy, that you would like to share with our viewers? Well, my biggest health tip for, and it's not mine, <laughs> but I do, and I'm, I am not affiliated with this person, um, but this book is called Chemo Secrets for, uh, Chemo Secrets to Thriving. Um, it's a, it's a less than a hundred page book. Um, and it has been the best thing that has happened to me during my chemotherapy experience because she does, she is a breast cancer survivor. Um, however, the author is a breast cancer survivor and the author is Roxanne Brown. Um, 
she it's very it's lots of pictures, really funny stories, but she gives lots and lots of tips about thriving through chemotherapy. So it's something that your family can read. It's something that you should read so that they understand what's going on with you and that you also understand what's happening to you and that you're not in it alone. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, more importantly um, than that is to really seek out a support system. You have them around you. There's people around you that want to help you. And if you let them know um, and you let them know that they need to be on your time <laughs> mm-hmm. and that 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 both parties, both you as the patient and the person who's going through chemo and the person who's helping you, the the primary requirement is that you both check your egos at the door. Um, you know, you as the the person who's the receiver needs to check your ego and say, okay, I need this help. I need my my sister. I'm 44. My sister had to put my socks on. Okay, um, and my sister walked in the door and said, it's okay. I'm going to put your socks on. When my mom was here, she was you know talking me off the ceiling at two o'clock in the morning because I was an anxiety attack because I didn't know what was happening to me. Um, and so she was able to do that. And, you know, if I asked her to do anything for me, she would have, and she did. So, um, so please, you know, just seek out a support system. Those are great tips. I would like to say that I just, uh, lost a good friend to breast cancer and he was about 62 years old. So I wonder if you have a quick piece of advice for men and women in terms of checking yourself and follow-ups and examinations. Thank you. Yeah, um, it is important that everyone, uh, breast cancer in men is less prevalent than it is in women. Um, Every, you know, one in eight women will get breast cancer each year. So that I think turns into about 12 0.5% of all women in the United States will get, you know, breast cancer or be diagnosed with breast cancer in a year. So that's a, that's a pretty big statistic. Um, men it's less. Um, so however, it is imperative that you as women, um, do your self exams and you also, um, make sure that you are uh, doing them on a monthly basis. You teach your daughters how to do it, or you go to the gynecologist to make sure that they know how to to teach you and your daughters and your sons how to to check for lumps in their breasts and to to get things checked out immediately. Um, the standard of care is changing. The 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 diagnostics are changing. Um, things are moving very for things are moving forward, and it's it's. You know, early detection is the cure, actually. Uh, we're talking with Barbara Bruzzo, who's a healthcare professional uh, who started her own healthcare navigation, Living Well Partners. She's a, a counselor. And I know that you will have a great health tip for our listening and viewing <laughs> audience as we ask each of our guests. So, through all of your spirituality, Give us something, Barbara. Okay. I, I would say, so I'm going to say two things. One is very what I feel spiritually and emotionally based, which is it's very important. One of the, one of the key things that I do when I work with clients, so they come to me for any reason. Like I just got a call this morning from somebody who found me on the internet whose father is in, is on in the ICU at New York Cornell Hospital on a ventilator, and they want an advocate to help them with next steps. Um, My goal is for whomever I work with to cultivate the self-awareness necessary to self-heal on all levels. Like I believe that everybody's life purpose is the same. It's it's, and that is to live an authentically empowered life. But in order to live an authentically empowered life, you need to be integrated, whole. And in order to be integrated and whole, you need to heal on all levels. And that would be physically, emotionally, energetically, and spiritually. 
And in order to heal on those levels, of course, in certain cases, you need the right doctor and treatment and medication or whatever therapy. But what you need more than anything is self-awareness because it's you, it's your inner awareness of your own needs and, and what's working and not working for you. And it's very important for you to check in with yourself where you literally just quiet, you just sit and you sit quietly and you scan, you take a moment, you, you become still and you, and it's, you, you check in, you, you scan your body, you ask yourself if this is, if what you're being told to do resonates with you. Is this working or not working? And for many people, they know this when they have gut reactions and yet they ignore them, you know, where they they might get a little pit in their stomach where they just, they have a reaction and they need to pay attention to those reactions. And then the other thing I would say is more a functional type of thing, which is try your best to never be hospitalized in the month of July. (laughs) (laughs) And that would be because all the new medical students become interns. So they go from being students to medical doctors like that in a day. (laughs) And you don't want to be hospitalized July 1st. (laughs) Oh man, I don't even want to get into that one. But (laughs) I know that I know that those two health tips are going to make the best of 2013 <laughs> uh, health tips. <laughs> those are great. I, love I talk uh, with each of our guests about uh, a special health tip, and uh, I was wondering if you, in your experience, either through emergency medicine or emergency medical services, uh, have a health tip that you would like to share with us. Well, I, I have a, a couple of little ones that I, I see all the time, and you almost made me talk about it in the very beginning, which is when you were talking about the flu. So, um, it, 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 and Christina mentioned how when she goes to her clinic, she's given a mask and an alcohol hand rub. W- what is little known and hardly ever discussed is that alcohol is a more effective way to clean your hands. It's called hand hygiene in medical circles. More effective way to clean and disinfect your hands than soap and water. You hear a lot about using soap and water, and people feel as if alcohol is a a distant second in keeping someone from transmitting a disease. But in fact... With a few rare exceptions, alcohol is more effective than hand washing. So that little alcohol bottle is a good idea to bring with you. And when you're touching possibly contaminated surfaces, you should be using that that alcohol. And and right now with the flu around, and, and by the way, Christina, I wouldn't be doing that victory dance quite yet about not getting the flu because <laughs> every shift I work... I see several patients coming in with the flu that just started the day before. Mm-hmm. So it's still um, still time to be to be vigilant. Oh yes, <laughs> that we don't stop, <laughs> especially you know, with the, a child in school with six hundred and fifty other students. <laughs> you, exactly, yes. and, and that's where where, as you well know, um, flu goes through like like literally like wildfire. Mm-hmm. So the second, Glenn, if if I could take one more minute, is is my other area of interest is in designing systems of care to take care of heart attack patients. And yeah. from the time you dial 911 till the time you have your coronary artery, that blocked artery that's causing the heart attack, reopened in systems around the country, including right here in most of our places in California, is very, very short. We, we can act very rapidly. Everything is like clockwork. What we can't control, however, is the amount of time it takes from the time you get your chest pain to the time you've decided it's time to seek medical care. And we have now medical systems where from the time you call 911 to reopen your artery is less than an hour. The, the ambulance responds, it diagnoses, takes you to the right hospital, sometimes bypassing the closer hospitals. The cardiologist meets you, takes you to the cath lab and does this complex procedure to open up the artery. And that can take less than an hour, but people 
throughout the United States, throughout the world actually, wait an average of two hours before they call. So we, we can't make our systems much better than they are except by encouraging people when you have the symptoms of a heart attack. For men, that's almost always going to be chest pain or shoulder pain or arm pain, sweatiness and nausea. For women, it could be just simply being really tired. And if you can recognize those symptoms of a heart attack, I'm going to I'm going to direct you to looking at the Heart Association or other websites to to understand them better. Think about calling 911. I'd I'd rather have you come into my emergency room not having heart, had a heart attack than die at home because you didn't recognize the symptoms. Mm. Which brings up another interesting point uh, that I wanted to mention in terms of uh, <clears throat> taking care of yourself and thinking about uh, being in a restaurant with foods. Mm -hmm. This virus now is capable of living at water temperatures above 140 degrees. Wow. So even washing your hands, was that was one of the questions I was about to ask. You know, does it matter if you're using hot or cold water? Yeah. In this case, it really doesn't because that's pretty darn hot to be washing at 145 you, degrees. Right, exactly. So the, the part of the point is for your own hand washing. That's why the vigorous scrubbing uh, may compensate a little bit for that hmm. and for the length of time. That's why I said 30 to 60 seconds mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of that. But the other part that we don't think about is if you're... If you are a dishwasher and you hand wash your dishes, mm -hmm. you are never going to clean them from the virus, or probably not, unless you yes. vigorously do this, because you're, you are not going to get up to the temperatures required to kill this virus, which, which then means that uh, dishwashers, on the other hand, right. certainly do that, which means that you have to be concerned that when you're out at a restaurant, is the person in the back washing the dishes by hand during this uh, winter season, or are they using a dishwasher? If they're washing it by hand and you're and you come in at eight o'clock in the evening for a nice dinner, all of those plates that were used and reused and used and reused by all of the masses of people that are carrying this virus around with them during the day and having that dish hand washed uh, is being accumulated. Right. I know, so. the, I know the pots and pans are usually all hand washed in, in restaurants and things like that. But uh, I, I also know that um, uh, a lot of the, the people who are washing, uh, they have gloves on and their water gets pretty hot back there. Mm -hmm. Um. But I'm just thinking, what about when you're at home and you have gloves on so you can tolerate hotter water? Um, would that do it? it? Everything helps unless, of course, that the virus gets on the gloves. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it does more. Yeah. You know, any, anything that can be done certainly uh, should be done right. rather than ignoring and doing nothing. So anything you do... Uh, especially hand washing and being very observant of things. Anything you do will be potentially helpful, but it's important to know uh, on the, of course, the prevention part or the preparatory part that I always look at is, you know, doing all the things you can. And again, you know, to what degree do you want to do this? Do you want to wear gloves around all the time? Do you touch bathroom doors in public facilities? What do you touch? Do you shake hands with people anymore? Do you even look at people? Do you, how, yeah. close, do you, how close do you come to people? So uh, <clears throat> We might as well all be walking around in the bubbles. <laughs> well, I, that could be where it goes. Each person goes into their own little bubble and we text each other. Uh, we're speaking with Dr. Philip Woods, a doctor of dental surgery and a periodontist. He works uh, with uh, public health and the Department of Corrections and Bureau of Prisons. And I'm sure that with all of your uh, training and expertise and journey, you have a health tip that you can give to our uh, viewing audience. Uh, anything you would like to share with us today? There are just three pieces of parting advice. One I've already t tackled, and that's if 
if you've been away from the dentist a long time, for whatever reason, if you're just afraid, if you notice that there's a problem like bleeding gums or sensitive teeth, and or you have a question about that tooth that you think might be in trouble, call your dentist. The advice is don't stay away. I feel like I'm a minister in church. Please don't stay away. <laughs> Come back. Come back to your, uh, find a dental home. Uh, if, if you don't want to go to the dentist, call, make an appointment with your dentist at the community health center in your area. And if there's a dental school or a dental teaching or hygiene institution in your area, call for an appointment just to get a checkup. And if you're very afraid of being at the dentist's office, let them know it's very helpful in terms of how they uh, manage your treatment. The second health tip, wash your hands. It, it, it's an amazing help in keeping away colds and flu bugs. And uh, there's a great uh, bit of information on the web from the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and Prevention about how you should take about 20 seconds to do it with running water and soap. And then lastly, the only advice that's really not health, but it's total health, I think, is Sing your song. Once you know what it is, and I don't mean musically, I mean life-wise. Sing that song. Do that work which brings you joy. Because if you don't do it, the world, the universe will never have it. It's yours for a reason. So sing your song. We're talking with Chao Pang, Master Chao Pang, a uh, uh, teacher and student himself of Tai Chi and the martial arts. And like all of our other guests, we ask for a special health tip. Most of the people are usually in some form of Western medicine, but uh, I think uh, I'm hoping that we have something very interesting from you today, Chow. Do you have a health tip for us? Um, you know, since uh, I think this whole program we've been talking about it is really just about... how you feel. So every day spend some time, it could be a place, could be a music, could be poetry, something, do something that make you feel good. <laughs> Feeling good, it, you know, to me, the, the, the sad part is most of us feel like I had to, in order to feel good, we had to do something It's almost a reward. Like if we work hard, we make money, we'll be happy. <laughs> and I think that, People got to totally reverse. Why don't you start feeling good first? Do something that makes you feel good. Then do some, Then go and do the stuff you need to do. Instead of wait till the end. The problem is when you wait till the end, you never find time to be happy. So start now. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicate you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes of your day. Do something that makes you feel comfortable, makes you feel spacious, makes you feel loved. That's really what, what Qi medicine is all about. We're speaking with uh, Richard Goldman, who is a physician who was an emergency physician, uh, practiced uh, family health, and now is the medical director for palliative care services in uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in Northern California. Uh, we always ask our guests, Richard, uh, for a special health tip, something that you on your journey have figured out, and you've had a pretty amazing journey, seen a lot of things. I'm anxious to hear what kind of a health tip you have for us. Boy, that was the most challenging part in preparing for this, and I didn't have anything <laughs> until until doing a meditation this morning, actually, and then it came to me. Okay, isn't that funny? You know, I, I was thinking about, you know, saying, you know, eat more vegetables or things like that. Uh, and so here's my tip. It's take the stairs rather than the elevator. And that has meaning on many levels. Now, obviously, one is that it's physically healthier to be active and to move your bodies and, you know, to go up the stairs. But it also provides an opportunity to be aware of, you know, what we have often in our lives of uh, habitual and reactive behavior, you know, an automatic resistance to something that we perceive as uncomfortable, you know, we don't want to do. And so... When you're faced with the choice of the elevator or the stairs, one would naturally say the elevator, but that's an opportunity to say, to encounter, you know, a, a certain reactivity that may just be habitual. So 
taking the stairs rather than the elevator provides us that opportunity to encounter resistive uh, or reactive habitual behavior. Um, and taking the stairs rather than the elevator can serve as a metaphor for life, and that is to be engaged in it. Because each day, you know, I see people who are in circumstances, you know, they're moving towards the end of their life. And so that provides me each day a reminder of how blessed I am, how grateful I am, how all that I have in my life. And, and to be aware of that and that the issue is not that we should be fearful of death, but that to be in celebration of life and that how we want to live the life from moment to moment and that the choices and the options that we have, the things that matter, uh, really demand us to be actively engaged in our lives and consciously engaged. And so take the stairs rather than the elevator, uh, however you want to, on whatever level you want to interpret that, that's going to be my medical tip for the day. We're talking with Peter Wright, a certified hypnotherapist and a past life regression therapist. Peter, we always ask our guests for a special health tip, and I would like to ask you for one, and I would maybe even like to ask you for one from this lifetime and maybe from another <laughs> lifetime. So you, you can have two if you think about it. Okay, well, I believe my health tip to everyone listening is something I've already mentioned in passing here, which is um, forgive others. Don't hold on to grudges, please. Forgive yourself, love others, love yourself, because at the end of the day, it's all about love and forgiveness. Um, and it will help you on your own soul's journey by releasing, letting go, and getting out of the way. We're speaking with Marilyn Tam, uh, international speaker, consultant, humanitarian, and author. And each week, uh, Marilyn, we ask our special guests for a health tip, something that you have found on your amazing journey that uh, you might want to share with our global viewers. Do you have something for us today? Absolutely. You know, in my own life, as well as my clinic, and in, in all the consulting and speaking I do around the world, I find the one thing that's the biggest hindrance to happiness and to health is stress. Um, in researching my book, the, the, the Happiness Choice, we found that over 80% of all physical health issues come from stress. And so I would say any way you can reduce stress, it's going to really be helpful for your health. But that's a nice term to say, oh, reduce stress when we're feeling like the world is coming, crashing down around us. So the, the small things we can do to make a change is to say, Stop whatever is making you panic at the moment. Of course, if you're in a house burning down, <laughs> run out. <laughs> then you do this. But, I mean, for most times, uh, we don't encounter a situation that is dire. It's more something that's weighing on us, um, something that is a, a challenge in the bigger picture. Is to stop for a moment and ask ourselves, can I take a deep breath now? And then go ahead and take a deep breath. And then say, can I take another? Do it again. After about three or four, then say, okay, can I take a moment to just move my shoulders? Take another deep breath. And let all the air out and say, am I going to die from this? And most of the time, you're not going to die this moment from whatever it is. Then give yourself enough space to say, What's most important to me? Is it solving this issue or is this just something urgent but not critical? So in the process of distancing yourself a little bit from whatever is stressing you out so much, solutions will come. Your body will lower, lower it to, back to a level of a little bit more normal. The cortisol will go down. And you maybe have a chance to really resolve whatever, whatever it is that's bothering you so much in a way that's more beneficial than if you're just running, running, running mentally as well as physically in some ways to try to solve something that's overtaking your mind and your, your body. Just relieving that stress helps 
you in so many ways. Besides, you look better and you live longer, too, when you're not stressed out. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you for that. That's a great health tip. We're speaking with Dr. Tony Bark. Uh, She's a medical doctor and a doctor of classical homeopathy. She also uh, has her center for uh, disease uh, prevention and reversal. And Tony, we know that you've given us a lot of tips, and I would like to ask you if you have a health tip for us today, but this may be an opportunity if you want to refer back to uh, your talk with Christina about uh, improving the libido. Orgasms? Yeah, let's talk. Do you have a health tip on... A health tip on I orgasms. Feel like, I feel like Dr. Ruth Westheimer. <laughs> Four orgasms. Masturbate. Well, thank you. That was a perfect. No, but oh, the that, breath that, that I tip? talked about is, is really good. You know, if you can sit in meditation, even if you just start at 10 minutes a day with slowing down your breath to, you know, um, five five breaths a minute with exhalations twice as long as inhalations, counting and focusing on your breath, you will find that at the end of the week, it made a huge difference in your life. Um, I do. It's very, very simple. Uh, and I have two different ones. One is, is, uh, um, shows my bias in terms of my form of practice, but do yoga, (laughs) find, (laughs) find, find a, Find, find your way into some form of embodied practice that is about breath. Uh, uh, so that's one. Um, it doesn't have to be yoga, but some form of embodied practice that is about breath and connecting to breath. Um, and the other is comes right out of what I was saying before about Tibetans walking around things. Um, take walks. Um, cool. Walk places. Uh, um, I, I grew up in Southern California and um, spent a couple of summers in in LA uh, at, when I was in college. And I, I, it was just after coming back from my first trip to Nepal the first time. And um, I walked everywhere in Nepal. And all of a sudden, I couldn't walk anywhere. I had to get <laughs> in my car to go walk on a treadmill. And you know, it uh, so find places, find ways to walk. And where I live now, I walk a lot, but I still have to get in my car to go home in rural Vermont. So it's not like it's just a city problem, but yeah, breathe and walk. Oh, I guess we're really fortunate where we live here in LA. (laughs) Got a lot of nice hills and stairs and yes, it's in the middle of the city, but we walk every day and we do our morning mile. So that's great. (laughs) We're speaking today with Ann Diamond, a marriage and family therapist and a licensed psychological clinical counselor. And Ann, each time we come to near the end of our uh, great episode, we ask our special guest for a health tip. And I wonder if you have something for us today. Well, I do. I um... That works out. (laughs) <laughs> and I'll Otherwise, tell you what it is. Be, I want to tell you where moment. I learned it. Where I learned it from. When I was a teenager, uh, there was a a woman. She was a minister of the Congregational Church in in Weston, Connecticut, and she gave free yoga lessons to teenagers, which was just wonderful. And one of her Uh, pieces of advice was to always keep your feet supple that if your feet are supple you will have youth and so she advised that you uh, wash your feet with cool water before going to bed and massage your feet with uh, lotion or oil and so I have always kept that with me that is something that I do and she said that the more supple your heels are, the better health your better back health you'll have, and I think I think she's right, and so um, that is my health tip. <laughs> you know, I I love this part of the show because I really never I, I never have an expectation for what someone's going to say, but I always somehow think that it's going to be necessarily about what they do, what they know best. And every one of them surprised me. They come from the heart and they come from great wisdom. And that was another one. I never expected something like that. <laughs> but but great. And I see that too, especially with, um, you know, feet and posture and 
issues going into the ankles and knees and hips and back and all the way up to the head and jaw. That's a great uh, piece of advice. But it's also, well, I, I, I read into it like a, a metaphor for relationship, keeping ah. everything supple. If you are supple within your body, because in reflexology, everything happens in the feet and it goes up through the body. So if your feet are flexible and supple, it, it goes through your body and then it will also um, uh, manifest itself in your spirit. And as we uh, traditionally do, one of our long ancient traditions is to ask for a health tip from our guest. And I wonder if you have something for us. Oh, well, um, I always advocate a self-care, not looking outside yourself, whether it's to a, a medical doctor like yourself there, and I'll do regard there, Glenn, or myself, an Ayurvedic practitioner, but to uh, understand your own body, your own strengths and weaknesses, your own imbalances, and what uh, foods, herbs, and approaches work best for you. So you are in a sense, maintaining your own vehicle, not dependent on going to an outside person looking for answers or a cure, but understanding your own body. So healthcare, self, not, not healthcare, but self-care, learning to care for yourself. And if I could add to that, I always try to encourage uh, my clients to think in terms of making progress with your health, uh, not perfection. In Ayurveda, there's mm. not so much, you know, oh, you're, you're sick and now you're cured. It's not that black and white. It's a matter of continually making progress to improve your health on a, on a holistic level, helping with all of the areas that I mentioned here, uh, sleeping, eating habits, digestion, uh, lifestyle habits, uh, and all of these aspects that uh, can help improve your health and to continue to work on these so your health is uh, better and uh, not deteriorating. And uh, of course, this is uh, increasing your longevity. And that's the real purpose of Ayurveda is to, to live longer. And uh, so there's really no cure in that sense. There's only progress, improvement. Um, I, I would say the, the most important piece for me uh, towards good health or to keeping that balance is, is as simple, Glenn, as smiling. Hmm. Smiling each day from within um, and allowing it to come out. And it, to me, it's got to be simple for everyone because then it's not like you're working hard. Hopefully, you're not working hard to smile. <laughs> Um, you know, really feeling that moment of joy inside our hearts, being grateful for what we have. Um, you know, we, we hear of these things happening all around the world, uh, yesterday in Boston, you know, with the bombs going off, how can we not be grateful? How can I not be grateful today, waking up in bright sunshine, watching the winds blow, you know, the leaves? And that smile, that just that one little thing, even if it's once or twice a day, but to be really conscious to smile. And when you smile and gift it to someone else mm. and bring, you know, it's infectious. It can be infectious. And, and even if you can see someone who is, I, this is my challenge all the time, is like if I see someone in the street that, that's looking down or, or whatever, like not, not having a good day, I purposely, purposely smile and say, good day to you. Mm. And the reactions, whether it be a homeless person or uh, an individual that looks like they're having a rough day, not once have I gotten anything, but a, anything else but a smile back. Beautiful. And I love the idea of it being a gift. Also, gifting it to someone. That's fantastic. <sighs> Kathy, we talked. Uh, I still want more things from you. I have many more questions to ask you. But I want to make sure that as we're speaking with Kathy Groover, our uh, massage therapist, our Reiki master, our author, and 
doctor of natural healing, I want to make sure that you have another health tip for our viewers. So this would be the time to give us a health tip, Kathy. Hmm, I have so many. Oh, let's see. Um, I know, everything you say seems to be a health tip. <laughs> I was say, what, did we just do an hour of health tips? <laughs> uh, um, here, here's the health tip for today, um, because I've been dealing with this a lot in my own life. Find a way to play. Uh, we all work so hard and we're so focused on so many external things, whether it's the IRS audit or the promotion at work or publishing the next book or running the kids to soccer practice. We have to make sure that we are playing ourselves. Um, and I have really started to try to take more time in my own life to play. I'm very type A and I'm very driven. And anybody that knows me is going, oh, yeah. Um, but we have to take out that time to play because that is boosting those feel-good hormones in our brain. It is getting us back in touch with nature and the earth and that free um, freeness that we had as a kid. Uh, there were kids at my dance class the other night, and they were running back and forth across the parking lot and just giggling uncontrollably. And then they were swinging on the pole and giggling uncontrollably. And I turned to my dance instructor and said, do you remember when life was so simple that spinning on a pole brought us to such peals of laughter? And he smiled, this big smile, and he said, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? These simple things that kids do every moment to have fun and to make themselves laugh, we don't do that anymore. And I really think that's lacking, and I think we'd have such better health if we just learned to play again. We should all, <laughs> that's a great health tip. I'm thinking of installing a pole in my house. <laughs> As we speak with Dr. Kathy Groover, who is an author, uh, educator, uh, has her own television show, and is a licensed uh, massage therapist who does body-mind work, we're going to ask you for a health tip, but it seems like you just gave us some. I hope you have another one for us. I do. My health tip does encompass the whole thing of body, mind, and spirit. We have to put good things in, and we have to put good food in, we have to put good thoughts in, and we have to put a good spirit in. And to me, that is the trifecta of health, is making sure that we are encompassing all of those things of body, mind, spirit. And we talk so much about you know exercising and organic and low BMI. We rarely talk about what we're putting into our minds, um, both from external and internal sources. And to me, I think that's the missing key to health. Even if it's 10%, if we can make that difference for a 10% return, I think we need to. So put in good stuff. That's that's the tip. I thought of a health tip for today. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you mean, uh-oh? All right. What's the health tip? Well, I don't have to give it if you're Watch worried about it. Watch this over and over again so you know exactly a, where everything is. That was an interesting. Um, I was thinking of the word guzzle. Guzzle. When you think of the word guzzle, I guzzled this drink or I guzzled, you know, something. Mm -hmm. That's my health tip. Don't guzzle. Don't guzzle. Mm. Yeah. If you, if you find yourself saying I was guzzling and you're not doing it right. <laughs> See, that's funny. I, I, that's funny. Cause now that I think of it, I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> guzzle. Yeah. It was like, Guzzle. Well, I haven't heard that word in a long time. And then when you said you don't guzzle, I thought, I, I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard it the other day and I haven't thought about it because, uh, but I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, that's not a good thing. Right. We shouldn't guzzle. Right, 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 right. So I don't, I don't know if that will actually make the uh, health tips of 2013, but it, just thought I would well, throw it I think out there. Then, then, then add why one should not guzzle. Well, one should not guzzle. Uh, in order to know why, you should watch all of our episodes with Tracy Harrison. Then they will know why not to guzzle. Right. Basically, you're just putting too much uh, into the stomach, which is in the left upper quadrant, as we know now, too quickly. And, uh, you know, depending on what you're putting in, it might be too cold, too hot, too spicy, too much amount. Too much and... alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I say that because I just watched uh, a, a couple of people guzzle down a beer in one yeah. shot. I mean, in one shot. I was, I, I almost fell back because I was like, 
Wow. <laughs> I didn't think the body could handle that. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, ultimately, it can't. We're speaking with Tracy Harrison, a wellness and health uh, consultant and coach who is a true scientist in the field of nutrition. Uh, Tracy, like we ask all of our guests, we wonder if you have a health tip for us. I do, Glenn. Uh, I think out of everything that I have learned, um, if there's one thing in the nutritional arena that I think generally will help pretty much anyone in, in this modern day and age, it is to eat less wheat. Um, things made out of flour. Um, a, a lot of people are working under the mistaken belief that as long as it's whole wheat or whole grain wheat, that it's okay. And, and what we're increasingly learning, especially in the past 10 years of nutritional science, is that that's not true. Uh, even whole grain, stone ground, um, whole wheat bread still spikes blood sugar really terribly. Um, and, and because of how much we've hybridized wheat as a plant, we've turned it into a substance that a lot of our immune systems are not sure whether that's a food or a foreign invader. And, and wheat is often at the root of some chronic um, inflammatory symptoms in my clients. So um, whether it's for metabolic or inflammatory or immune system or gastrointestinal reasons, I find the vast, vast majority of my clients feel better eating less and less wheat uh, in their diet overall. We're speaking with Dr. Gary Winston, a biochemist, a toxicologist, and a water entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, and Gary, it's come to the time of the show where we always ask our guest for a health tip. I'm wondering if you have something you'd like to share with us. Oh, sure. Gosh, there's so many thousands of health. Well, I think the, <laughs> the last health tip I gave was avoid obesity, right? Correct. The last one I got, I gave because um, there's just so many disease states. It's a heart condition and diabetes and so forth. And, and, and we are a pretty fat nation, let there be no doubt. But I think in keeping with the theme here, I would say a good health tip, stay hydrated. Stay mm. hydrated. Mm. Drink two to three liters of water a day. Don't drink sugar, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, sugar, uh, carbonated beverages, substitute it with water. When you go to a restaurant and they say, would you like something to drink? Sure, have your glass of wine, but also make sure you order a glass of water on the side with a slice of lemon. Stay hydrated. For all those reasons that I gave you as to why water is important, right down to helping to dissolve your nutrients, to spread your nutrients, to maintaining your body temperature, to, uh, oh, no, let's not forget the kidneys, too, really, really does let, let, lighten the burden placed on kidneys. That's why I say drink water. Don't drink Coke. Don't drink juice. Don't drink coffee for every time you get thirsty, because all that does is make your kidney work twice as hard to filter out the stuff that's in there. Uh, let, let me just, just maybe one tip just to echo something that we talked about last time that I think is really uh, key beyond chewing your food. I think one of the healthiest habits that folks can have around mealtime is to not drink too much water during their meals. Uh, in the, we just talked about how critical it is that our stomach acid be very acidic and have a very low pH. And so if you drink too much water during your meal, you're diluting that acid. And it, it's a major cause of acid reflux or excessive belching as a result of a meal, simply because the stomach acid isn't strong enough because it's been diluted to really efficiently break down the food and move it on. Um, the, it's very important to be hydrated, but it is much more therapeutic to hydrate in between meals and only just have a few sips as necessary during your meal so that your digestive juices, especially in your stomach, can stay nice and strong for good, swift digestion and make it a lot more likely that we'll avoid acid reflux or um, indigestion or belching or just the general feeling of fatigue or overfullness after a meal. And as you know by now, Tracy, this is coming to the time where 
we want our really special health tip. And I think the bar <laughs> is getting higher and higher for you each time. So do you have something for us? I do. Um, so going back to our discussion about genetically modified foods, I get a lot of questions from people about um, if, um, if I'm going out and I'm buying as much organic as I can afford, and maybe that's not very much given my food budget, um, and um, where do I need to be the most cautious about genetically modified foods? And, and I think there are two examples. Um, that if, if folks can follow this, they will go a long, long way of making sure that they don't have uh, GMOs in their diet. Corn and soy are um, the two most prevalent um, genetically modified foods in our common food um, regimen uh, diet. And, and so trying to make sure that when you purchase um, corn type foods. So say corn chips, that's a place where it would make sense for you to spend the 10 or 15 cents more to get organic corn chips rather than non-organic ones. Because not only are you not getting the pesticides then, but the organic standard is making sure you're not getting the genetically modified corn. And I think this is really particularly important for um, families with children because um, different types of immune system dysfunction or um, over the overwrought nature of immune systems is incredibly common in the current generation of children, especially of elementary and middle school age. So when you're purchasing corn type products, look for organic. When you're purchasing soy-based products, like maybe soy milk um, or tofu or tempeh, look for organic. Um, again, the organic standard excludes, in principle, any genetically modified ingredients. And given that upwards of 90% of all corn and soy raised in the United States is genetically modified, I think those are two food areas where you want to be cautious. And by paying attention to those, you can do a good job of really making sure that that core 90% of your diet doesn't include GMOs. That's a great tip, Tracy. And just to reiterate, before you said if something has a number on it that's a four, it means inorganic or not organic. And if it has a nine in the number at the beginning of the long number, then it has the possibility for being organic. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, and you really want to check because there are a lot of stores, unfortunately, where the label on the bin will say organic, but you want to check what actually made it in the bin. Because it's not necessarily organic produce. <laughs> there you go. So as I said, we're coming to the end, I think. Yeah. And I have a, a health tip. Oh, good. That I would like to share with everyone, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. I went to a, <laughs> I went to a uh, public screening the other night of a movie called Following the Ninth in the Footsteps of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It's by a Kerry Candell. He's an independent filmmaker, and he's looking for funding for his film. And it's basically a film that shows the global impact of Beethoven's Ninth on the world in different places where major things happen, like China and Tiananmen Square in Berlin when the wall came down, in Chile uh, when a dictator took over and was torturing people, in Japan, and a number of other parts of the world where they play the Ninth and they sing uh, Schiller's Ode to Joy. And in this movie, it was just fascinating. And I started thinking about the Ode to Joy, which I love. It's one of my favorite pieces in Beethoven's Ninth. So please, all of you German-speaking people, excuse me for my attempt at German. But at one part of the Ode to Joy, it says, <clears throat> Alle Menschen werden Brüder. And it means all people are connected. Mm. And so what my tip for the day is that I think everyone should take a moment out of each day and consider an ode to joy. Mm. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman. That is a, a lovely moment that we should all take. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And let that manifest. And this is the time when we always ask for a health tip and we have the benefits since you've been so kind to do uh, a number of shows with us. We've gotten a lot of your health tips, and now we're looking forward to another one. What do you got for us? My health tip for, um, for this show is um, to encourage people to explore green tea. 
You you really can't open a, a newspaper or a magazine or turn on the television without hearing something being promoted about green tea. But I'm going to talk about a couple of the benefits of it. Um, first of all, green tea is caffeinated. And I find that the average American is drinking too much coffee. And, and there's nothing wrong with coffee. It's not an evil substance. And as long as people aren't particularly caffeine sensitive and they don't have an ulcer or IBS um, or uh, acid reflux, I think coffee, you know, one or two cups a day is fine. But lots of times people struggle with coffee in the afternoon because what most people don't know is that the half-life of caffeine is well over 12 hours. So sometimes it's that cup of coffee after lunch or in the afternoon that actually causes people sleep problems later on. And sometimes it's tough for people to say, well, I just won't have anything. Um, and they wrestle with caffeine headaches or maybe uh, um, exhaustion, uh, a real fatigue slump in the afternoon. And green tea can be a great solution for that because it does have caffeine. It's quite a bit less than a cup of coffee. Depending on the tea, it's about a quarter of what you would have in coffee. But as I mentioned earlier, um, L-theanine is an amino acid that is very calming. And green tea has lots of L-theanine in it. And so I find it can be a nice balance for people where they get a little bit of mind focusing from the caffeine. But the L-theanine keeps that from being too stimulatory or um, anxiety promoting. And so it's a nice solution. Plus, people get the huge array of polyphenols that are present in green tea that are being studied today for everything from reducing arterial inflammation and heart disease to um, helping to uh, reduce cancer markers and, and initial um, animal research. So there's a lot of good things happening in green tea. And I encourage people to try it, um, realizing that sometimes people have to try a variety of brands before they find something they like. And cheap green tea tends to taste like a paper bag. So <laughs> don't try some cheapo brand and say, oh, I hate green tea. My tip for today is that I think the two best brands of green tea on the market are Mighty Leaf and Numi. Nice, high quality, whole leaf tea that tastes great and they don't taste like a paper bag. As we do with everyone, as our custom, we're looking for a health tip. And I'm really excited about uh, <laughs> the possibilities here. So do you have a health tip for us? Well, this is my advice for everybody for, the, for immediate uh, advice. Eat your greens. Mm. Now, the greens uh, resonate at 528 sulfazio. It's a frequency of the heart. It's also a frequency of chlorophyll. And I'm a big, big fan of the greens. It has to be raw. Of course, you can eat cooked greens, but if you want to get the maximum benefits from the green juices, you know, uh, of the green foods, it has to be raw. If you look at a red blood cell, there's basically there's five atoms. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen surrounds the, the uh, iron. And in chlorophyll, there's the same four atoms uh, that surround magnesium. So... <clears throat> they're, they're very, very similar. And just because it's similar doesn't mean that they're going to match. But biochemists have shown that when you ingest, ingest green foods, you're going to get healthy red blood cells. So we don't want to just get new cells. Yeah, you can get new cells eating anything. You're going to get new cells. But we want to have healthy new cells. And also, by eating the green, you're also um, saying to yourself... Uh, I love myself. I'm also working with trying to align that heart frequency. And if you look across America, you know, there's something, something wrong with there's so many heart problems, whether it's the, you know, it doesn't matter what the name is. Uh, if we're going to make a change, you know, it, easy, just eat your greens. So that's my advice. I always tell you, eat your greens. <laughs> As always, simple but clear and uh, right on. We're fortunate to have uh, you back for a second show, so we get another uh, health tip from you. Do you have something to share with us today? Many years ago, and, I, and I, I'm not sure, but in our clinics, there was a few postcards. Someone left a little postcard, and I wanted these postcards. I actually use it, uh, the quote in my book, Support the Mountain, and I, I couldn't figure out, because that day we were really busy, I couldn't figure out who left this postcard. They didn't leave a name, but the postcard said, it was, it was written by a Japanese uh, uh, man, Yobi uh, Yamada, 
And it said, if you don't take care of your body, where will you live? <laughs> but, if, but see, if you think about that, it's really not just taking care of the physical, because what it really means is we are not the physical. We are this spiritual consciousness coming into our body at this particular lifetime. But while we're here, uh, if we don't take care of our house, you know, where are we going to survive? So mm. as long as uh, we have the spiritual journey in our physical, um, you know, I ask people, if you're not sure, whatever you're eating, you say to yourself, this is going to become a part of who I am. This is going to become part of my brain, part of my whatever. And if it's okay, then enjoy it. But if you have doubts, then maybe you should have make another choice. So if you don't take care of your body, where will you live? We're speaking with Dr. Hui Huang, who is an internist and integrative uh, medicine practitioner. And this has been a fascinating show. And like for all of our guests, we always like to ask if you have a health tip that you would like to share with our listening audience. Uh, the health tip, uh, I just gave you the health tip, that is to rest well and sleep well. And I think that the secret of maintaining energy, and that's the secret of anti-aging. Um, uh, you may have heard of uh, people turn white hair overnight. Uh, that does happen. Uh, and so that tells you that stress can cause sleep problem, and that can cause you to age much faster. And so if you rest well, and if you sleep well, and then that will go a long way towards health. Uh, we can talk about how to sleep well and how to rest well later because it's a long, complicated uh, uh, subject. Uh, but for now, that's a short tip. Uh, we're looking for another health tip from you. Another health tip. Well, um, I knew we were going to talk about melatonin, and um, I, I thought I would use that as a, a segue for something that is oh so obvious, perhaps, or hopefully to our listeners. But I find the vast majority of my clients uh, and readers really don't honor enough the importance of sleep. I think in today's day and age, sleep is something that most people are trying to avoid. Uh, I've seen a lot of people um, shout with glee of the fact that I only need five hours of sleep a night or, or I can survive on only four and a half with the assertion that that creates a lot more time and space to do more, to be busy more, to be active more, to go and do and go and do and go and do. And I, I find that people are really shocked to find out how much better they feel when they allow their body to sleep as much as their body actually needs. And my my actual tip and this is going to shock a lot of people, but if you'll if you'll try it, you might be stunned at the difference it will make. Go to bed such that you don't need an alarm clock to get up at the time that you want to get up at. Mm. Now, Christina, I can practically see you rolling your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You know, what's interesting is I don't usually need my alarm clock. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. And I'm not against alarm clocks. I think it's a great backup strategy. But generally, we should go to bed at a time that our body can wake up when it wants to, and it's before our alarm clock goes off, so that we're not having our sleep interrupted by this loud, alarming, chaotic sound. Talk about starting the day off on a, a stressed out foot. <laughs> Um, and, and it's amazing to me how often we'll make the choice to trade off sleep for wellness uh, in order to watch yet another TV show. Um, people are shocked when they actually try, try it. I, uh, just for the next Absolutely. two weeks, I want you to go to bed at the time that you think you need to go to bed and allow your body to wake up. People tend to think they won't fall asleep. Um, they won't be able to get up in time. They'll wake up in the middle of the night. Most people are shocked that if they will actually lie down and be still and have dim lighting or no lighting, their body will go to sleep and, and they will sleep much more than they thought they needed to or had to. And the, the simple act of being well rested is often the difference between feeling okay and feeling fantastic. It's very simple. It's free. For most people, no supplements required. Uh, it's just a matter of prioritizing it.
And it's very simple, so I don't want folks to feel shortchanged, but I, I really hope you trust me and try it because it is powerful, the difference it makes in the energy you have on a day-in, day-out basis. That think of sleep as an inner invitation to stop doing. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a lovely way to look at it. Yeah, it is, because we spend our day doing even though we're beings, human beings, uh, we spend our day doing, which is, uh, you know, appropriate. But at, at the end of the day, one of the things that we know scientifically, at least about sleep, is that it's a time for rest and restoration and healing. So it is considered, and it should be considered, an inner invitation to stop doing. Mm. Mm. That's a very nice way to look at it like that. And it really does affect so many things, doesn't it? I mean, if we don't get a good night's sleep, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. So I want to, unless you, uh, if you have a concept, if you have a thought for your own process in um, sleep. Yeah, I, 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 I do believe, uh, Glenn, I mean, there was a, a time where I didn't need as much sleep, literally. It, it was like five hours, you know, and people would be, my friends would be sleeping 10 hours, you know, it was, it was amazing to me. Uh, the, the, the energetic person I, I was growing up and all the way really till I had a child, I, I mean, I could bounce around all day and who knew why. Um, but you know, my, my average was five hours and, and it, I felt great. Uh, I could live off of the three, but <laughs> My best shot was the five. And uh, it, and as time has gone on, it has shifted. It has really shifted to like, you know, a good seven, seven and a half hours of sleep now. Um, and uh, I do know if I oversleep, I do get a headache as well. So I, I think for every individual, you sort of find find that place where, that works for you and be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think that you just you just said it right there. Uh, be honest, because if you say a person who likes to say, "Oh, I only need two hours of sleep mm -hmm. a night," and then you watch them during the day, they're either drinking twelve cups of coffee, or they're nodding out, or they're yawning, or they're dreaming about bed. Then they don't really need two hours of sleep a night. Everyone needs to sleep, mm -hmm. or most everyone needs to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, time for your health tip, Tracy. My health tip uh, is actually something, interestingly enough, that's come up with a number of my clients, um, certainly over the years, but in particular, for whatever reason, in the past few weeks, I've caught myself talking about this repeatedly. And that is the role of caffeine in impairing sleep. And I, I want to share something that I think a number of folks may find surprising. The half-life of caffeine in the body, depending on the person, is between 9 and 12 hours. And so, as we discussed before on prior shows, sleep is so vital for wellness. And I think when, when people struggle to sleep, it's one of the very first things I help them with because when sleep gets better, everything else tends to get better. But, but people are often shocked to learn that the cup of coffee that they had at 11 a.m., is still fully capable of disrupting their sleep when they try to go to bed at 10 p.m. And that's because, again, if the half-life is, let's say, 10 hours, that means your, your body has worked through half of that caffeine 10 hours later, but it's still metabolizing it. And depending on how sensitive you are to caffeine, it's actually fully capable of keeping you awake later on in the evening. So for, for again, people who struggle to either go to sleep or stay asleep, or maybe they sleep intermittently, uh, restlessly, where they don't sleep deeply and are, are easily awakened. I really encourage no caffeine after about 9.30 or 10 in the morning. And it's interesting, the number of people who have thought that wouldn't make a whit of difference, but who have tried it, and, and after a few days in a row found that they did sleep better. Mm. And, and so it's not so much about do you have coffee with dinner or even do you have coffee in the afternoon at 3 o'clock. For some people, that cup of coffee you have at 11 or 12 is actually making a difference in your sleep. And for occasionally a person, the caffeine that they're having at 8 a.m. is actually affecting their sleep. Wow. So I like to support better sleep. So for those of you listening who wrestle with that, give it a try. At a minimum, try to get rid of any caffeine. So tea, coffee, mate, 
chocolate, anything that has caffeine in it, try to get rid of that after about 10 a.m. and see if that doesn't improve your sleep. You might be surprised. Mm. Mm. I think that's a great tip, but I, I felt the, uh, the universal force of all coffee drinkers shaking and <laughs> shuddering. <laughs> that there was just this. <clears throat> to your point, it's an interesting trade-off because I think as long as it's in moderation, there's nothing toxic about coffee. But depending on a person's individual physiology, I hear you, mm-hmm. the caffeine can be a problem. And, and sometimes people find going to half decaf, half regular, maybe that helps, or even just taking the portion size much smaller, or moving from you know a cup of coffee to just a shot of espresso. Most people are shocked to find out that espresso, ounce per ounce, has le- um, less caffeine than coffee, mm. uh, even though it tastes stronger. Uh, it's actually not caffeine wise. Um, so, um, but That's I hear you. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy <laughs> coffee as well, but there is a trade-off sometimes. You said, and again, you perfectly segue into <laughs> the possibility of getting a health tip from yep. you, because that sounded so much like a great health tip uh, <laughs> that, uh, I'm just wondering, and uh, do you actually have <laughs> another like health tip for Um, I do, and 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 this is something I I practice, and uh, I've been doing it for a long time. And I think we get so stuck on the outside. How are we going to stay looking younger? How are we going to be thinner? How are we going to be happy? I'm, you know, and it's all on the inside. You know, just peace come from the inside. Center yourself. Find some quiet. You know, I do it before I go to bed. I do it in the morning before I do anything else. Um, it is between you and yourself and no one else. And the peace inside, I mean, you can see horrible things. You can see sad things. You, 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 you just watch the news and you're depressed, you know. If you just look inside, you can settle yourself down. The vibrations you've talked about, the cells in our bodies are all going in You know, you can feel the vibrations of your soul if you just sit and just quiet down and you'll find it all inside. It's just, it's a process. It doesn't happen within one day. I don't think I've perfected it. And um, I don't think most, but I think it's, it's a journey you have with yourself. Um, And I, and I think that too much time is spent on things that are on the outside. And I think people need to just kind of come back to themselves. Mm. That uh, wonderful health tip was brought to us by Poonam Chowdhury. She's an internal medicine doctor. She's a hospitalist. She practices in emergency medicine. She travels around the world helping people. She's a teacher and a researcher. It's time again, Tracy, as you know more than anyone now, for our health tip. I love health tips. Uh, I'm going to share one of my favorite ones today, actually. And this goes out to um, all of the women out there who struggle with perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms, which is a huge portion of our population. Um, Women can struggle with all sorts of different symptoms as a result of not just low, but more importantly, fluctuating hormone levels. And there are a a tremendous number of documented risks with um, using, in particular, estrogen therapy um, Mm -hmm. for women who still have their ovaries. Um, But um, what a lot of people don't realize is that there are weak estrogens, weak estrogenic properties in a whole host of different foods. And I have used ground flaxseed, believe it or not, ground flaxseed to help a huge number of my um, uh, female clients in this age range to get relief naturally from things like hot flashes or uh, dry mouth, dry skin, um, or uh, vaginal dryness. Um, these are the kinds of symptoms that can plague a, a lot of women, not just in or postmenopausally, but in the throes of menopause or during the perimenopausal years. You only need about two tablespoons of ground flaxseed each day. Um, and, and what happens is that the 
the weekly estrogenic uh, molecules within flax fit into uh, estrogen receptors in the body and actually block the ability of the stronger estrogens from triggering cellular action. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of clinical research pointing to the benefits um, of flaxseed um, for um, helping to prevent um, breast cancer and also being used as a um, complementary therapy. Uh, and of course, as we talked about earlier, it's a wonderfully mineral dense food. It's an awesome source of plant based omega three uh, fats, uh, and also a source of protein. So there are a lot of different reasons to choose it. You don't have to cook it. Uh, you do have to eat it ground to get the hormonal benefits I mentioned. It cannot be whole. Um, you also have to eat it ground to get the omega-3 benefits. Mm. Um, so when you grind it, uh, you can buy it ground or you can grind your own in a, in a coffee grinder or a spice grinder. You do want to keep it in the refrigerator uh, to prevent uh, spoilage. But you can sprinkle it on top of almost any food, um, in yogurt, on top of a soup, add it to a smoothie. Um, sprinkled on top of even sc even scrambled eggs for breakfast. Mm. Um, but a nice, simple way to get some hormone relief that doesn't involve medications or um, stronger, potentially riskier hormone therapies. Now, would it make a difference, uh, Tracy, if it was cooked or not? Because I, I know a lot of us use it in our baking. Right. So for the benefits that I'm talking about it, we need it to be not cooked. We need okay. it to be raw. Okay. And and just for the record, by the way, you don't really want to cook omega-3s at a very high temperature. Um, they're very uh, vulnerable to oxidation. So I think if you're using it um, at a low temperature, it's fine. Um, and at a high temperature, um, as long as the seeds are whole, it's not going to matter very much. Uh, it's a good source of roughage in the mm -hmm. diet. Um, but the omega-3s are really locked inside. But I don't recommend heating to any high temperatures things that have um, a lot of omega-3s in them because it, it will oxidize the fats pretty readily. Excellent. We're speaking with Meng Ling Sui, and she has been teaching us a little bit about the mind, and we're going to be learning a lot more about the mind as we go on. And at this time, Meng, we always ask our guest for a health tip. And although you've probably given us a number of health tips already, I wonder if you have something for us. I think I've probably alluded to it several times during the course of this hour. I think I would say to people, always be with your truth. Be with your truth. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter whether it may be a bit unsavory for you, <laughs> maybe that, um, hmm. you know, maybe that you're really angry at somebody you love or, or, or whatever it may be, that it's always better to be in the truth. Because if you're not in the truth, get into defenses. And when you're in the truth, you come closer to being your, um, your more authentic self, who you really are. And, um, and that's, that's a reward in and of itself. I think I'll just take a deep breath on that. Great health tip. And I appreciate that. I want to um, add, the sooner the better. <laughs> yes, yes. No, it it gets of... too hard as you get older. The sooner the better. Get it over with. But there's so many truths that, that we might want to avoid. And it, it, and mm. it comes back to what I was saying about hum being human. Being human involves... Um, really spectacular acts, really noble acts, and some thoughts that are not so noble. Mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> and, and it's better to be in the truth of that and say, yeah, this is, this is what I feel right now. What am I going to do about it? And, um, and I think we avoid that. We, we tend to avoid certain truths. We try to um, use substitutes to, um, to, um, to not be with ourselves in our truths and whether whatever those substitutes may be, you know, drinking, eating to excess, shopping, working too much, all sorts of ways that we we find to um, to not be with ourselves and and to try to fill ourselves in ways from the outside rather than fill ourselves from the inside. Mm -hmm. We need Segovia working for the government to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, Netflix is here's your health policy and what movie do you want for the next couple of weeks? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that would be Segovia's direction, yes. <laughs> We're speaking with Michael Harris, Director of Government Affairs at CENCAL Health. And Michael, you've always been involved in public health policy to protect and serve the public. So even as an administrator, I'm sure that you have a health tip for us. 
I, I do. I think, you know, even today, um, there's a new study out that says sedentary life. So if you're somebody like uh, us that gets up early in the morning, goes to the gym on the way to the office or goes to the gym after work, the fact that we sit behind desks, the fact that we've become very sedentary, um, is it has been and even shows that sitting behind a desk all day and not moving around uh, can be as bad for you as smoking. I think it's it's my the key word I would just throw to everybody is moderation. You don't need to be the uh, ultra marathoner, but you do need to be out there and you need to get out and walk at night. Um, my fondest memories are walking with the kids during the during the sunset and just walking around our neighborhood. Um, I would say that moderation moderation in what you eat, moderation in exercise, and just get out there and move. I think that's great. I always add for myself everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> we are speaking yeah. with our special guest, uh, Carrie Sherman, who is a Tai Chi instructor and an educator and is trying to bring uh, Tai Chi to children in the classroom. Carrie, with all of our guests at the end of the show, we ask for a special health tip. And I wonder if you have something for us. I do. I have a great health tip that can absolutely change your lives. So Tai Chi is based on energy meridians in the arms and the legs and through your torso and in your head. And the energy has to move. But while we're sleeping, everything kind of slows down. So when you wake up in the morning, if the first thing you would do, or the second, if you go to the bathroom first, is to tap on your body, you will wake up your energy. So I always start the day with this with my students. We tap down the underside of the arm and up the back of the arm. And then we do the other arm, the other side. And we tap down our legs and we tap on our kidneys. And we can tap on our shoulders and on our heads like woodpeckers. And I have the students do that for about two and a half minutes. And what happens is that their skin begins to tingle. The blood begins to flow. The energy in the meridians goes to all the organs because you have 12 different energy meridian systems in your body. And my adults tell me it's better than coffee for waking them up. The students then are ready to go to school and ready to perform for the day. I had a PE teacher in New York City who attended a talk that I gave. and. Um, a year later, he came to me and said, I want you to come back to my school. I'm going to show you something you're not going to believe. And he had taught the entire student body to do Tai Chi in the gym as they were arriving during the day because they arrive at different times. And so he would have it on and everybody would start with the tapping and tapping everywhere on their body, tapping on the thymus gland to strengthen your immune system and the kidneys and up and down your legs and then we always pull on our ears mm. and whoops, my earbud fell out. Hold on. <laughs> pull, on, pull, on my, pull on the ears because all these energy meridians go through your ears. So you really want to stretch your ears too. And then after he had taught everybody this, he had cafeteria duty. So he said, now you're going to come to the cafeteria with me. So I went to the cafeteria and everybody walked in. I don't know if you've ever been in a school cafeteria, but it's, it's always got tile. And it's always noisy because, you know, 300 kids talking is a lot of noise. And it's like not the nicest place to sit and enjoy a meal. But he, <laughs> he, he had all the kids walk in and sit down. And then he said to me, OK, you get up on the table. We do Tai Chi before lunch every single day. So I stood up on the table and he put on the CD and we all started tapping and playing with energy balls and all the things that we do. And here in New York City was total silence with these 300 kids in the cafeteria. I couldn't believe it. And when it was over, they could eat. And they even had a quieter atmosphere for eating. I think they might have even chewed their food a few times, you know. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. And so I've learned through my work to never say never. You never know where it's going to go. You inspire one person that he could teach the entire student body and they could do it every day. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And he's still doing it. 
eight years later. So wow. <laughs> We're speaking with Marissa Pay, a doctor of uh, psychologist, and she works on TV and radio. She's a motivational speaker. Uh, she does so many things, which we're just learning about today. I wonder if you have a special health tip for us, Marissa, now that you've given us your life's health tips. Mm. So the health tip is find the good. Always find the good because when you find the good, your cells go, Whoa, I want to work together today and we're going to process our food and we're going to make good food choices and we're going to drink a lot of water. So it all starts with that choice. If we find the good, or as Deepak Chopra says, choose love over grievance, or as Marianne Williamson says, choose love over fear. Um, if I am healthy, in my mind, I will be healthy in my body. I will be healthy in my soul. I will be healthy in my spirit. If I find what's wrong, I begin the chain reaction of unhealthy cells functioning, unhealthy emotions, unhealthy body. So it all starts with that first choice. I wake up, I open my eyes, I close my eyes, I take a deep breath in, and I just focus on the breath and give the mind time to connect with the source, to connect with that energy that is who we are, that is good, that is love, that is joy, that is creativity, that is harmony, that is wonder, that is bliss, that is forgiveness, that is creativity. That's the breath we take. Then we anchor it with eight things that we are specifically grateful for, that we can be thankful for. Wayne Dyer says five, but I'm a recovering overachiever. I'm probably the Chinese background, but I pick eight specific things to be grateful for. I don't get out of bed until I've done that. Wake up, sit up, take the deep breath, two minutes of breathing. That can go to 15 minutes of breathing if you can do it. And then the eight things that are you're grateful for, and then you go brush your teeth. And what happens is when you start brushing your teeth and you're already primed in uh, gratitude is you begin to look at yourself and go, you know what? That's not bad there. I look pretty good instead of <laughs> finding what's critical and, oh, I look blah, 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 blah. So setting that, that's the best health, t health tip that I can give you because what goes on in here will affect every other part of your body. <sighs> We're speaking with Tracy Harrison, our health and wellness counselor and food expert who's been with us many times and has given us many, many health tips. We're coming to the end of our show, and this is one of the favorite parts for a lot of our viewers and for, I know, myself and Christina to hear that aside from everything else you tell us, that you actually have another health tip. I do have a health tip, and I'm hoping I haven't covered it before, so you'll have to tell me. I have a backup if I did. But um, as we come into uh, the autumn and the winter months, um, a number of people may be struggling with congestion. And it's a great time of year to um, put a focus on minimizing congestion. And I find that I, I have a number of clients who have chronic nasal congestion or post-nasal drip where they may always be clearing their throat. And certainly this can come from other reasons, silent reflux, these kinds of things. It is really quite common and I find much more common than is typically reported in medical literature that individuals are having low-level reactions to dairy foods that would be promoting congestion. And so for people who are trying to find the right diet to get rid of that annoying congestion or need to blow one's nose a couple of times a day, every day, um, throughout the year and maybe even more during the winter, I would encourage you to, to do an elimination experiment where you fully remove dairy foods, milk, cream, cheese, 
yogurt uh, from your diet for a full 15 days and see how your congestion does or doesn't improve. If it makes no difference, then you've done a valid exploration and you know that you're not sensitive to that. But I'm amazed at how many people are, Glenn. Um, I'd say at any given time in my practice, at least a good third of people have found that their congestion goes away if they eliminate dairy foods. So especially as we're getting into a time of year that tends to make congestion worse, it's a really good time of year to start investigating that because obviously clogged uh, nasal passages and sinuses can become hotbeds for other viral infections and actually encourage more frequent um, colds or uh, sinus or upper respiratory infections. But the root cause may not be the passing virus. The root cause may be this low-level simmering congestion that individuals can have as a, re as a reaction to dairy foods. So something to consider. I uh, can tell you that you have not said that one before, but I was tempted to say yes so that we could hear your backup. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, it's interesting. We interviewed Marissa Pay. Uh, an organizational psychologist, and she had a 21-day fast from complaining. And you have a 15-day fast from eating dairy. We're speaking with Kabir Southwick, our professional health consultant, Ayurvedic and naturopathic practitioner. And Kabir, it's coming near the end of the show. And uh, we know you had a great health tip for us last time. I'm hoping you have another health tip for us today. Well, uh, I have a lot of health tips. Uh, I don't know why it's on my head today, but uh, I recommend everybody uh, to uh, cleanse the colon. That's right, cleanse the colon. It's not a, a pretty subject, but uh, it is a very important. Uh, unfortunately, in Ayurveda, the views are very different than in the West. In Ayurveda, they recommend using enemas and using oil in the enema, and I see this as a common uh problem here in the West of uh, excessive cleaning, uh, particularly through colon hydrotherapy. So Ayurveda mostly uses herbs and uh, enemas with uh, oil, but it's one of the first steps in detoxification and first steps in uh, cleansing the body. And uh, over the years, doing uh, colon cleanses for people, of course, they're adjusted for each body type, the colon cleanse we would give for a vata is very different than what we'd give for a kapha and for a pitta. Um, and the health benefits are phenomenal and very quick. And it's a very fast way to uh, improve your health is to improve your uh, detox or we should say cleanse the colon. And, and how often are those cleanses given? Like, like, is there a series? You know how many times is there's a series, like you would do it like three times in a row or, and then stop for a few months and then I resume again? Well, the best time to uh, detoxify and cleanse in general is in the spring. And the worst time would be um, in the early uh, winter. So now would not be the suitable time to cleanse the colon. Um, now's a time where... We need heavier foods. We need to eat a little bit more, more oily foods to keep ourselves a, a thick in our skin, keep ourselves warm, put on a little extra fat during the winter. And then in the springtime, this is a time to detox and uh, starting with cleansing the colon is recommended. And uh, we can see that I'll be giving, I give workshops every year on detoxification and the spring is when I do the colon cleanse. We're speaking with Dr. Lynn Cagle who's the clinical director of the Kegel Autism Center and the director of the Eli and Edith L. Broad Center for Asperger's Research at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And you have shared some great information with us today, and I'm hoping that you have a health tip for us. A health tip. Okay, let's see. Well, I have a health tip that relates to autism or any, probably any child is really focus on your child's strengths and see what you can do with your child's strengths. Because, or I guess that could, doesn't have to be a child for anybody. Everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. And if we really focus on people's strengths instead of their weaknesses, we'd have a lot better society and our children would do a lot better. And probably our peers would do a lot better too if we focused on their strengths instead of their weaknesses. I, I'm wondering if Dr. Woolman is going to share with us uh, some health 
tips for this time of the season when our kids are getting high on sugar, <laughs> and some of us are as well, um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the weather out there and what each of us are contending with, depending on which cities we're in. So I am so looking forward to his, uh, his magical mixture. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think that there are many hazards around Halloween that we need to be aware of. And one of these is, you just talked about all the candies and things like that, uh, licorice, black licorice. I this think is we something... have to be aware of strangers at this point. <laughs> uh, that's another issue. Be aware of strangers. We could talk about that. When you're out trick-or-treating, don't, don't take candy from a stranger. Don't go into a stranger's house uh, without, uh, without uh, a parent or someone else with you. But we talk about the black licorice. If kids... Oh. And adults eat too much black licorice, and that could be, you know, a dose of, I would say, two ounces a day for two weeks. And sometimes that happens when kids have so much candy, they hide it, and they're eating it for weeks at a time. Black licorice has a product in it called glycerazinic acid, which affects the sodium and potassium in your body, and it can change your heart rhythm. So it's very important to be aware of not taking too much licorice. So, so before you go on, is this part of your health tip? Uh, everything I do is part of my health tip. So I would love to take this opportunity for myself to thank you, Christina and uh, Segovia, but for all of the great work that you have done throughout this year to bring uh, education, wisdom, and health on so many levels to so many people and knowing that it's not just in this time, but all of the work that you're doing uh, can go on virtually for uh, a very long time. So I would like to have gratitude myself for you and Yoga Hub and everyone involved in that. Uh, I'm thankful to all the people that have been on our show and uh, given their wisdom and expertise. And I thank all of my teachers for their wisdom and expertise, and and I thank my healers to keep me on my journey as we uh, explore various quadrants of the healthcare galaxy, looking for optimal health. And in in that moment, I also would like to wish everyone in this holiday season, I wish you all blessings of optimal health. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman, our medical guide. And of course, we here at YHTV would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us and supporting us on this new platform of education and information. And it's still considered very new, by the way. Um, we're grateful for your continuous support. And, you know, please, please let us know if how we can support you better. If there's a topic that you would like us to focus on, you know, please contact us. Don't be shy. Just uh, let us know. Um, everything's kept in confidence and we will definitely try to find the experts in those areas to come and speak with us. And again, we invite you every Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1.30 Eastern Time for the Magical Medical Tour. And Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Followed every other week with our new show, Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. Let me remind you that you can find and contact Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward, forward slash G Woolman and on Twitter at Glenn Woolman and of course through his own site, glennwoolman.com. And be sure when you're there to learn about his metaphor square breath. And that will definitely help you ride through any stressful situation. Until we meet again, namaste. 